Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to today's program, Medication Abortion in the post dobbs World, Current Litigation and Its Effects on Access to an Abortion, sponsored by the Women in Law Section and the Committee on Continuing Legal Education of the New York State Bar Association. This afternoon's program will run from 4 to 5 p.m. And during the course of the program, if you would like to pose a question to today's panel, please feel free to use the Q&A tab in the Zoom portal. Is at this time, I would like to turn it over to the newly appointed chair of the Women in Law section, Kimberly Wolf Price, for some opening remarks. Kim? Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you for everything you uh, do for us. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on today's program. As Ernesto said, my name is Kim Wolf Price. And as of June 1st, I'm the chair of the Women in Law section. In my day job, I am affiliated with the firm Bond Schenick and King. Um, our program lead today, Josie Reyna, is a great example of why it's important to get involved in the New York State Bar Association and some of the things you can do once you get involved with the Women in Law section. In the Women in Law section, we have a number of committees of the section, including our programming committee. And if you have an idea, you're involved and engaged, there are a lot of ways you can take that idea and do something like run today's program. We thank Josie for her efforts, her excitement, and her enthusiasm um, in working on the programming committee, but also in bringing this program to life today. As you can see from this list, there are a lot of programs. So whatever your interest is, if you're interested in joining the Women in Law Committee, I'm guessing we have a committee that will have something compelling and interesting to you. The Champions Committee, for instance, invites men to work on advancing women's issues within the Bar Association, the profession, and our society at large. We have awards committees. We have membership and engagement committee, reports, surveys, and publications, which brings us to another important piece, which is Wills Connect. Wills Connect is a magazine that we publish twice a year with the help of the great publication team at the New York State Bar Association. We're right now um, wrapping up uh, an edition that'll come out in August. So we still have a couple of weeks if you're interested in writing. We have a thousand members of the Women in Law section of the New York State Bar Association. And besides that readership, it also goes often broadly to more within the State Bar and is picked up. Um, the articles are often picked up by the Bar Association itself and published more broadly. The edition coming out in August of this year will focus on women's health. And we are going to talk about that in the most broad sense possible. Everything from professional health to personal health, mental health and beyond. So we encourage you to reach out. Kay Wolf Price at BSK.com if you wanna talk more about being part of the Women in Law section, publishing, getting involved more thoroughly in the section. We have great programs coming up here. Right, I'm sorry. Thanks, Ernesto. You can find us on the, on the website, but a wonderful program coming up um, and really in honor of the Juneteenth holiday is banning Rosa Parks, the impact of book banning on civil liberties. This program is important. It'll be run by the new chair elect, Fretra De Silva, and it's going to focus on how losing touch with our history can really have an impact on our future. And we're really looking forward to that program on Tuesday, June 13th from four to five, another webinar. We also have a great book club series that was um, created and is consistently run by Laura Sulem, the chair of our annual meeting and programming committee. And we're really excited that this one coming in September will be a book written by a member of the Women in Law section. We tend to highlight women attorneys who have written books and or issues that um, are important to the women in law in New York State and beyond. So please consider joining us. It's a free webinar and bring a friend or two. You'll always find those conversations engaging and interesting. Usually we take a little bit of a hiatus on programming over the summer, so that's why you see that gap, but you never know um, as things come up, we sometimes have to step in and um, get a little bit more active during the summer like we did in the summer of 2022. So we really encourage you to get involved and engaged we hope that you'll consider joining the Women in Law section. And I'm really just thrilled to have Josie Reyna take on today's program and um, lead it. And for this conversation with this panel of um, really amazing speakers, we thank them all for their time, um, for their commitment to discussing issues of importance, such as the medication abortion issue and the litigation field as it is right now. And um, I, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Josie now. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Kim, for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. Um, my name's uh, Josie Reyna. I am an associate attorney at Tannenbaum Kiel. 
Um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone who joined us today, um, as well as to all of my uh, panelists who graciously volunteered um, to uh, speak on this important topic. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Kirsten Moore. She is the founder and director of the Expanding Medication Abortion Access Project, or EMMA. The EMMA project is focused on getting the FDA to change the way it regulates the distribution of medication abortion in the U.S., um, consistent with the evidence and with women's needs. Also here with us today is Jenna Lauder. She is an Equal Justice Works Fellow at the New York Civil Liberties Union, and she focuses her practice on family and reproductive rights. Um, we also have Whitney Cloud. She is a partner at DLA Piper and a founding member of the firm's Dob Ta Dobbs Task Force. She, she litigates on behalf of and advises Fortune 500 companies regarding legal issues that arise in governmental investigations and class actions. And finally, we are joined um, by Linda Goldstein, who is senior counsel for the Center for Reproductive Rights. She focuses her practice on protecting and expanding access to reproductive care in the United States. She has been working on strategies to mitigate the potential impact of Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus the FDA, um, a case uh, we will be speaking about today. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten Moore. Um, she's gonna just start us off uh, with um, sort of a, a medication abortion 101 for all of us. Hi all, um, thanks for joining. Um, and so just as basic background, the FDA approved a regimen, a two drug regimen for medication abortion care, early abortion care, pregnancies up to seven weeks in the year 2000. And that two drug regimen includes mifepristone um, and that drug blocks the hormones that are necessary to sustain a pregnancy. And then the second drug, which is taken usually 24 hours later, is called misoprostol. And that drug basically starts the process of cramping and bleeding so a person can pass the pregnancy. Misoprostol had been on the market for many years. Mifepristone is a new drug. But together, FDA approved the label in, January, in September of 2000 with both of those drugs. And that's going to matter in some of the litigation issues that you'll hear about later. But medication abortion care, the FDA approved regimen, it, it involves both of these drugs. Um, so as you can tell, it's been on the market for more than 20 years. It has an incredibly compelling safety track record. More than 5 million people have used it in the U.S. alone. Um, and the serious adverse event rate is less than 0.05%. Um, the most likely, you know, less than ideal outcome is that it doesn't work and you have to double up on doses of misoprostol or the pregnancy doesn't pass completely and you have to go in for a procedure to, you know, end the pregnancy altogether. But again, the um, track record for this drug is really reassuring. Um, and WHO has continued to evaluate it and is recommending it for use in all kinds of settings, even um, without the supervision of a professional health care provider if you don't have one. So that's um, just something really important to know. The other thing about the mifepristone and misoprostol regimen is it is actually um, the gold standard, according to ACOG, for treatment of early miscarriage management. Again, because miscarriage, excuse me, mifepristone will shut down the hormones that are necessary to sustain a pregnancy. So in miscarriage, something's gone wrong, but in some cases, the pregnancy is still attached to the uterine wall. So MIFI can shut it down and then miso can push it out. So when FDA first approved mifepristone in 2000, they did so subject to something called subpart H of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And you'll hear some of the opposition, people who want to put mifepristone back under lock and key, talk about subpart H as being something that FDA uses to fast track drug approval. 
Um, that is true in some cases, but really what subpart H does is give FDA the authority to put more restrictions on the distribution of a medication because they have some questions or concerns about it. So typically FDA approves a drug and they're approving the drug label and then that drug is out in the world and healthcare providers do what they will with it. Um, in the case of mifepristone, FDA said, well, we think this drug, we believe based on the evidence that we're looking at, this drug is safe enough um, to be prescribed, but we're going to take, you know, um, use the better part of caution or caution is the better part of valor, whatever, you know what I'm saying. Um, and um, we're going to say that only, only certified prescribers um, can prescribe this medication. And then that medication has to be dispensed to a patient directly in a clinic. And that patient must sign a form saying they are knowingly taking a drug to end a pregnancy. How do you become a certified prescriber, you might ask. In this case, all you have to do as a licensed healthcare provider in a state based on whether your state allows you to prescribe is sign a piece of paper that says, yes, I know how to date an early pregnancy, which of course most women can do because we can tell you the date of our last menstrual period. Yes, I know how to detect an ectopic pregnancy, which of course is very, very hard to do early in pregnancy because there's nothing to see. And remember, mifepristone is used at 10 weeks or less of pregnancy. And then, yes, I know how to refer for treatment or complication of backup care as needed. Again, something any licensed healthcare provider can do. So those are the restrictions that FDA put on the product. Um, and those restrictions are commonly referred to as the risk evaluation mitigation strategies. Um, those, the REMS program didn't exist at the time that FDA first approved mifepristone. Uh, Congress gave FDA these authorities in 2007. So the original restrictions that FDA put on the drug were kind of grandfathered in at that point. Um, so kind of nothing much happened for the next five years or so, um, or ex excuse me, into 2016, I was, anyway, in 2016, the drug sponsor submitted additional data to say, we need to update the label because the original label said mifepristone could only be used up to 49 weeks and you had to take more mifepristone and less misoprostol, but uh, clinical practice in that intervening time showed the drug could safely be used up to 70 days and that you actually needed a very low dose of mifepristone and more of misoprostol. So the drug sponsor wanted to put the change in the label to make the label consistent with the evidence. They encouraged FDA at that time to reevaluate the REMS. Um, FDA well, it's a complicated story, declined to do it for the most part. They left the REMS intact, but they did make some really important changes, again, in the label itself. And the original label said only um, physicians could become certified prescribers. The 2016 label change amended that to say licensed healthcare providers can prescribe based on the prescribing authority in their state. Um, the original label had required the physicians to hand over the pill directly to a patient in the clinic and the patient take the first pill, mifepristone, in the clinic. They dropped that requirement in the 2016 label update. So those were some important changes, again, all based on evidence that the FDA's scientific staff reviewed and looked at. Um, and as I said, Emma or Emma was started to try to get rid of some more of those or to chip away at those restrictions. And we had a whole plan and that plan involved looking at the miscarriage indication. Um, but uh, a couple of things happened, one of them most importantly being the COVID pandemic. And at the time, at the start of the pandemic, FDA issued some guidance that said, okay, drugs that are subject to REMS, and there are only about 50 or so drugs that are subject to REMS, um, we are going to acknowledge that this is, you know, an unprecedented time and uh, healthcare providers are trying to limit um, the exposure to the virus and for their patients and themselves, their staff. Um, so we're going to allow you all kinds of flexibilities under the REMS to decide how you want to prescribe and dispense the medication. But this guidance had a footnote in it that said, this does not apply to drugs that are subject to in-person distribution requirements. Now, the drugs that basically are subject to that requirement are usually cancer treating drugs, right? So they're 
medications that have to be individually titrated, that have to be delivered in a physician office because they're going to be monitored in real time. Mifepristone was the only product that where the label says, well, you have to come in and pick it up in a clinic, but you can take the medication at home. Um, so they were sued by ACLU and ACOG and some other players, and uh, the lower courts agreed with the plaintiff's arguments and said, this doesn't make any sense requiring people to come into a clinic to pick up a pill that they can take at home, especially during a public health emergency. Um, and so for a time, for a period of time, um, the certified prescribers um, were adapting their practices to begin to use telehealth services, right, virtual or um, audio consultations with patients, or asynchronous, you know, you fill out a form, and you give the basic information, and then um, the certified prescribers were literally FedExing or UPSing the medications from their offices, their clinics, to patients. Um, over time, uh, two mail order pharmacies came into being. And so now the certified prescribers could send their prescriptions into the certified, um, excuse me, they could send their prescription into the mail order pharmacies. And then the mail order pharmacies would be responsible for shipping the drugs to patients. Um, and that allowed actually a new cohort of virtual only certified prescribers um, to sign up. So not people who aren't working necessarily in a brick and mortar clinic. So again, during that time period, and again, this was also happening in Canada and, and UK, a lot of evidence and data was collected and showed that that um, protocol was equally effective, equally safe, no more adverse events uh, than in clinic use. And basically what it showed was that patients were getting their medications sooner <laughs> because they didn't have to wait for an appointment to open up in a brick and mortar clinic. So based on all of that data, again, FDA took another look in the REMS and in December of 2021 decided that the in-person distribution requirements should be permanently lifted, that it was no longer necessary um, for the distribution of MIFI. So in theory, at that point, they opened up the door to um, pharmacy distribution. It took a full year for the drug sponsors and FDA to agree on what the pharmacy distribution is. But in January of this year, in 2023, FDA agreed on the system that the, farm, that the drug sponsors put forward and said, yes, now pharmacists can dispense mifepristone. Um, and a couple of, you know, within a week or 10 days, um, you might have seen the news that CVS and Walgreens both raised their hands and said, yes, we were going to dispense this medication. That um, process has subsequently been complicated by a lot of things, including the litigation um, our, my colleagues are going to talk about in a moment. Um, but it's also just complicated because FDA regulates the, the safety, uh, FDA evaluates the safety of drugs. States regulate the practice of medicine and the practice of pharmacy. So there are a lot of complex laws on the books that are kind of running headlong into this change that FDA wants to make. Um, I can tell you that in some states, predictably blue states, um, there are independent pharmacists who have signed up to become certified pharmacies, and they are filling prescriptions from uh, certified prescribers. Um, and I can confirm that the major retail chains are still working away, despite all of the media hoopla you might have heard around Walgreens in particular, they are working away at setting up a system where they can dispense in the states where there are no complicating laws on the books. Um, the, the hiccup here is trying to protect the um, identity confidentiality of both patients and certified prescribers, right? Nobody wants to put a kick me sign on the back of certified prescribers who are writing these prescriptions. So it's gonna take a little while before we get to the brick and mortar dispensing, but it is coming. Um, so if patients, in terms of access today, if patients want mifepristone, um, if they want the FDA approved medication, they have to go to a certified prescriber and then that certified prescriber can, if they still want to dispense the pills directly in person, send the uh, prescription into a mail order pharmacy and have it delivered that way. Or if that certified prescriber has established a relationship with a local brick and mortar pharmacy, the patient can get their prescription filled at a local pharmacy. 
There are other options um, for patients who feel they don't have access to that because their state has shut down all the abortion clinics or they just feel uncomfortable going to a provider. Um, there's something called aid access, which will provide patients with um, uh, mifepristone, not necessarily the FDA approved product per se, as in it's not made by the drug sponsors here in the US who are subject to FDA oversight and regulation and um, inspection, et cetera, but reliable sourcing of, of mifepristone. Um, and they will have that medication delivered directly to their home. For patients in that scenario, there are some other additional resources since they're not going through a regular clinician or through a clinician to get the prescription. There's something called the MA hotline, uh, miscarriage and abortion hotline that will provide uh, technical clinical help for people as they're experiencing this and they have questions about what's going right, what's going wrong, they can call that hotline. Um, there's a legal hotline because again, states are really taking draconian steps to try to criminalize uh, people's access to mifepristone and abortion pills writ large. So um, there's something called the repro legal line. Um, so those are some of the, the ways in which people are accessing abortion today. But I just wanna close before turning over to the litigation itself is, is to say kind of, I've been working on this literally since the mid nineties. I was at the population council, which um, was the entity which conducted the clinical trial here in the US. And I was there when population council was granted the authority to conduct the clinical trial been working on and off with this issue. And we always, I always were kind of, I was taught by my peers and my, my bosses, like mifepristone medication abortion care was gonna be the change factor in abortion access in the US, right? Because in 2000, think about it, it was when clinics were under severe attacks from the opposition and uh, healthcare providers were being targeted and murdered by the opposition. Um, so the idea that a patient could go to their own healthcare provider and get the, the pill and, and, and take it themselves um, was really just, we, we thought, groundbreaking. It took a long time before that uh, ground really broke. It, it was only um, in 2021, I believe, where medication abortion care became the standard for early abortion care. Care. Up until then, most uh, people were opting for clinical procedures, in-clinic procedures, but now uh, most patients, again, who are eligible are offering are opting for medication abortion care. And that has set our opposition's hair on fire. And they are showing they are willing to do anything to, as I say, like put the genie back in the bottle, put the pill back in the cabinet behind lock and key. And they are, they are really coming at this medication in ways that I frankly had not anticipated um, and that are straight up you know, challenging FDA's approval and authority, which I had not anticipated. Um, they have been filing citizen petitions with FDA for years saying you got it wrong um, when FDA said, well, we're looking at the evidence and we say you've got it wrong. Like they literally in January or December of 2021 issued a 40 page response to the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists <laughs> taking apart their argument uh, piece by piece by piece and saying, nope, uh, we, we've, we've looked at the data and we're comfortable with what we're doing. Um, but, you know, the, the, the opposition will do anything to create the chaos and confusion, which in turn creates cruelty for patients and providers who are trying to access this care or provide this care, and that's their objective. But, you know, just keep in mind as you hear more stories about the litigation, FDA has done a rigorous review on this medication multiple times. The safety track record really is self-apparent. Um, and as I said, um, this is the, the, the way going forward in terms of patients' choices for abortion care. So I'll pause there and, and turn it over to Linda and Whitney, I believe. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. Um, you really laid the groundwork uh, for the discussion of uh, the Alliance uh, for Hypnotic Medicine versus FDA case, uh, which is a case that probably most of you have read about in the paper, it poses an existential threat, not just to the availability of, of mifepristone, um, but also potentially to um, misoprostol as well. And so I'm going to uh, lay the groundwork to explain who the parties are in the, uh, in the case and what the plaintiff's theories are 
and uh, Whitney will then uh, explain uh, the rulings uh, that we have so far from the Northern District of Texas and the uh, Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court. Uh, the plaintiffs in the Alliance case are four physicians and four organizations, all of which are staunch opponents of abortion. None of the plaintiff physicians prescribes mifepristone to their patients for abortion care. The physicians claim to have treated patients who were prescribed mifepristone by other physicians um, and suffered complications. Uh, none of these physicians has identified any harm that they personally suffered as a result of providing that care. Uh, the motion for a preliminary injunction that the plaintiffs filed in that case was also supported by some declarations uh, filed by uh, certain members of those organizations who speculated uh, that uh, members uh, might have to perform a DNC procedure, a procedure needed to uh, complete an incomplete abortion um, against their conscience or that they might have to pay increased premiums for malpractice insurance. Uh, one of these uh, declarations was provided by a physician who said she had to cover, um, or I'm sorry, she had to ask one of her colleagues to cover for her because she was treating a patient who had taken um, uh, abortion pills uh, from India. Uh, and she also said that her um, partner um, had to treat a patient who had taken uh, medication abortion pills and felt that it violated um, her own, the physician's own um, conscience uh, to perform a DNC, uh, which is a standard procedure performed uh, in the case of miscarriages uh, on that patient. Uh, the defendants in the case are the FDA and Health and Human Services. Uh, Danko, which is the manufacturer of brand name uh, Mifepristone called Mifeprex, intervened in the case and have participated in all of the briefing. Um, the manufacturer of the generic form of uh, Mifepristone, a company called GenBioPro, um, did not intervene. Uh, the case is pending in the Amarillo Division of the Northern District of Texas, which is a one judge division, which means that every single civil case filed in that court goes before that judge. That judge is Matthew Kaczmarek, a Trump appointee who was general counsel to a conservative religious advocacy group before his appointment. The plaintiffs asserted venue in Amarillo because the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, uh, one of the organizational plaintiffs, was incorporated in Amarillo in August of 2022, which notably was after the Dobbs decision and a mere three months before uh, the Alliance case was filed. Uh, the plaintiff's arguments fall into three basic categories, um, two of which um, Kirsten's already alluded to. Uh, one, uh, they claim that the studies supporting the initial approval of mifepristone by the FDA were insufficient to establish the drug's safety and efficacy. This is notwithstanding the more than 20 years of experience um, by the 5 million people who have taken uh, the drug in that time. Uh, they also claim that the uh, uh, I guess, re reduction of, of restrictions and the uh, relabeling of mifepristone uh, that was done in 2016 uh, wasn't supported by a single study that made all of those changes. Rather, it was supported by a constellation of studies which um, made those changes in various permutations. Um, another challenge is subpart H, um, which uh, was in fact um, a regulation that was adopted by the FDA at the time of the AIDS epidemic to fast track the development of certain life-saving drugs. Um, when FDA approved mifepristone, it invoked subpart H not to accelerate approval, which was not remotely accelerated, 
um, but to support its imposition of uh, restrictions on the use of the drug. And the plaintiffs argue that mifepristone was not eligible for subpart H treatment uh, because pregnancy is not an illness. Um, it is merely a condition. Um, the third uh, basis uh, for challenging mifepristone is the Comstock Act. And the Comstock Act, students of American history might uh, recall this, it's a statute enacted in 1873, which criminalizes the transition by mail or by common carrier, such as FedEx or UPS, of obscene materials and materials for immoral use, uh, which it defines to include medications used to produce an abortion. Uh, plaintiff's argument is that the FDA should not have approved mifepristone in the first place, or at a minimum should not have approved uh, the availability of uh, uh, physicians to, uh, or uh, prescribers uh, to transmit the uh, pills to patients um, by the mail. Um, this is a potentially very wide um, ranging argument uh, because it could be used, you know, ultimately not against just mifepristone, but also against misoprostol. And, you know, frankly, um, any uh, uh, equipment that physicians or providers use to perform abortions uh, nationwide, not just in the states that prohibit abortion. Uh, defendants' uh, responses um, fall into several categories. Uh, one, as ought to be obvious from my description of the plaintiffs, is standing. Um, the physicians themselves uh, haven't pointed to any injury that they actually suffered because caring for patients is their job. It's not an injury for an emergency room physician to take care of a patient who shows up with some kind of um, medical um, emergency. Um, nor is there any reasonable certainty that they will be injured in the future. Um, the plaintiffs tried to establish that by essentially a statistical analysis saying, you know, so many millions of people take this drug, um, even if you use the, a small percentage of patients who um, suffer complications, that's still a sizable number of people. And there is some possibility that one of their, one of the plaintiff organization's members will have to treat one of those people. Um, and there's also a possibility that they will have to do that um, in a way that violates their conscience, notwithstanding the various protections against um, violating uh, one's conscience that uh, physicians would have under um, both state and federal uh, law. Um, and uh, I guess another argument against standing is that the physicians cannot assert standing of uh, the patients who took mifepristone um, because their interests aren't aligned. By definition, these physicians do not prescribe mifepristone, they don't provide abortions, and the patients are all women who sought abortions. Another defense, um, procedural defense, is statute of limitations. Uh, the uh, plaintiff's um, only challenge to the approval of mifepristone was in a citizen's petition filed in 2002. That uh, petition was denied in 2016, and plaintiffs had uh, five years to file their uh action in federal court if they disagreed with the response to their petition, and they simply didn't. Um, so that uh, is uh, the statute of limitations uh, defense uh, with respect to the initial approval. Um, exhaustion is another uh, procedural defense. Uh, the Comstock Act was not raised in any of the citizens' petitions that the plaintiffs uh, submitted. And under ordinary rules of administrative law, if you don't present an argument to an agency, when the agency has a process for doing so, as the FDA does, you can't take 
that argument into federal court. Um, there are also a um, number of uh, defenses on the merits of the claims um, with respect to FDA approval. Um, FDA is given considerable deference um, for its scientific uh, judgments. Um, the FDA is one of the oldest administrative agencies out there, and um, it was expressly given the power uh, to make these decisions on safety and efficacy, which are beyond um, the you know purview of the of the or I'll say beyond the competence of the legislative. Um, branch to make. Um, also, uh, strong arguments uh, were made that uh, there is no direct study match requirement. Um, the FDA has considerable discretion to determine what kinds of evidence it's going to look at when making a decision. Um, and there were also um, strong arguments made by the industry itself, uh, the um, uh, chief trade association for the pharmaceutical industry submitted an amicus brief, um, several hundred um, biotech executives and companies you know, submitted another um, amicus brief, you know, arguing that the um, expectations of market participants would be entirely upended if courts started to go into the business of second guessing the FDA's uh, approval process. Um, all the more um, the case in a drug that's been on the market for over 20 years. Um, with respect to Comstock, uh, it's essentially two arguments that were made. One that the um, FDA uh, is not charged with determining whether drug distribution complies with any of the many, many criminal laws which are potentially applicable to it. C, the opioid crisis. Um, FDA is charged specifically with evaluating the safety and efficacy of the drugs. Um, and uh, the uh, argument on the uh, on the substance is that the Comstock Act in the early 20th century was uh, interpreted by multiple courts of appeal uh, to limit it uh, so that the only uh, abortion items that are unmailable within the terms of the statute are those that are mailed uh, in connection with unlawful abortions and that uh, it cannot be presumed um, that any transmission by mail is unlawful because in every state, even states with abortion bans, certain abortions uh, do remain uh, lawful, um, particularly those uh, needed um, to provide life-saving care. Um, and I guess the final uh, defense uh, was one of uh, lack of judicial authority, essentially. Um, there's a statute, um, section, section 355E um, of the FDA Act, uh, which says that the FDA has to hold a hearing before withdrawing a approval of a drug uh, that is on the market. And uh, a court um, doesn't have the authority to uh, circumvent that statute by telling the FDA to withdraw a drug uh, without a hearing. So with that as prelude, Whitney will now tell you what Judge Kaczmarek did with those arguments and what the Fifth Circuit uh, panel uh, did. Right. Yeah, thanks, Linda. And I will try to um, keep it brief because this is the part that's probably the most familiar to everyone. Um, and has been uh, well teed up by uh, Linda and Kirsten. Um, so as you likely all know by now, um, on April 7th, the court issued its ruling granting the preliminary injunction sought by plaintiffs um, and, in, and effectively unwinding FDA approval of mifepristone dating back to before the year 2000. If that decision had taken effect, um, it would have made mifepristone an, an unauthorized drug. Um, 
So I'll get to where the decision wound up by the end of April in just a few moments, but just to highlight three points echoing some of what Linda has you know, laid out in terms of the arguments. Um, point one is that the court ruled that these uh, anti-abortion medical organizations and doctors had sufficient injury in fact to bring the challenge. So they had standing. Um, that, that ruling does a lot to expand Article Three standing potentially, because as Linda pointed out, none of the doctors had prescribed mifepristone, had taken mifepristone, had been ordered by their hospitals to administer it. And the record evidence suggesting any instances of having to help complete an abortion in the past were very, very sporadic and did not have a meaningful medical impact on their practices. So if this sort of injury, in fact, is upheld, it will be a significant potential expansion of who can bring suit challenging a drug's approval. Um, a second important point in this decision was the ruling that the FDA had violated subpart H in approving Mifeprex, which was Danko's branded Mifepristone drug back in 2000. The court questioned the FDA's approval of uh, Mifeprex under subpart H, again, as Linda mentioned, uh, under the basis that pregnancy is not an illness. And it ruled that the FDA was not entitled to our deference in that interpretation. Now, agency deference is something that uh, courts are wrestling with um, beyond the FDA. But as uh, Linda and Kirsten have both said, you know, the FDA's standing as an agency is, you know, one of one of the most revered agencies. Um, so again, this is a this is a really um, bold decision. Uh, the court also spoke critically about the FDA's changes both in 2000 and in later years to the requirements for distributing mifepristone to the extent that such changes veered from clinical trial protocols. Now, Linda touched on this, but that sort of requirement that the FDA adhere to the clinical trial regimen, um, there, are, there are reasons why certain clinical trial protocols are put in place, um, which the FDA has noted has been a focus of later briefing. Um, but uh, the court was not convinced by that argument. And then the final thing, you know, and again, as Linda touched on it, is the, the Comstock Act. Um, again, if, if the court's ruling on the Comstock Act, uh, which was that this provided a sufficient basis, you know, to believe that the plaintiffs would prevail in their preliminary injunction, um, and uh, that subsequent changes by Congress, including um, the 2007 uh, changes to the FDAAA um, did not overrule by implication the Comstock Act. Um, again, that would not just, that sort of argument, if upheld, would not just affect mifepristone, but could affect misoprostol. Um, so, you know, this uh, this decision uh, took effect in on April 7th. However, the court uh, did grant a seven-day stay of the effect of his decision. And uh, in order to allow the government and Danko to pursue appeals, um, which they did. Uh, within days, they appealed to the Fifth Circuit on an emergency basis. The Fifth Circuit issued, I believe it was like a 40-page opinion um, within five days, uh, unwinding part of the district court's decision. Um, and only the part that allowed approval um, or that unwound approval uh, dating back to 2000. The Fifth Circuit held that that portion challenging the 2000, uh, year 2000 approval of mifepristone, uh, that was untimely, you know, for reasons that Linda has already touched on, um, but not criticizing the decision otherwise. And they left, uh, the Fifth Circuit left in place requirements from before 2016. And Kirsten touched on a few of these earlier, but those uh, those 2016 changes affected um, how long um, the pre the pregnancy could be. So it took it back to only the first 49 days of pregnancy. It take it took it back to requiring three in person visits. Took it back to again requiring uh, supervision of a qualified physician, and also the in-person dispensation requirement. So if the Fifth Circuit's decision had taken effect, uh, mifepristone would be still a lawful medicine, but the, the requirements for using it or for um, obtaining it uh, would, be very, would be very different than they've been for the last seven years. So again, following um, a very short administrative stay uh, issued by the Supreme Court on April 21st, 
a 72 uh, Supreme Court issued uh, a stay of Judge Kaczmarek's decision in its entirety, which means that mifepristone can continue to be prescribed and distributed as it was before April 7th, um, post-ops. Uh, the case then ping-ponged back to the Fifth Circuit, which heard argument on May 17th as to the merits of Judge Kaczmarek's decision. Um, and I don't know if there's maybe time for just two sentences by Linda to give you an update on the um, the arguments. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give one minute. So it was a uh, three Republican judge panel, two judges appointed by uh, President Trump, uh, one judge appointed by President uh, Bush. Uh, it was very active questioning um, of both sides, uh, but uh, it is plain from the questions that the panel was uh, very skeptical of the government's arguments and specifically um, were ver was very skeptical of the notion that FDA um, gets any kind of special deference for its scientific uh, judgments and also uh, very lenient towards uh, plaintiff's standing arguments. Uh, so uh, I'll, just, I'll just leave it uh, there and pass it on to, I think it's Jenna. Where is it? I can't remember. Sorry about that. Uh, Jenna is just going to um, discuss uh, with us what New York is doing to protect to protect access to medication abortion in light of Dobbs as well as the Alliance decision. Thank you, uh, Josie, and thanks, Linda um, and Whitney. Um, so, you know, just to very quickly, you know, give a sense of what the impact of a decision like this could be, um, you know, medication abortion using the fipristone, uh is accounts for more than half of the abortions performed in this country every year. Um, and although this case is being litigated out of Texas, of course, it's going to have a nationwide impact. The FDA does not have a mechanism for approving a drug in some states and not in others. So New York is bracing for, you know, a pretty extensive disruption um, in an already very compromised abortion landscape. Um, and we have, as a state, been taking steps to try to mitigate, um, you know, the anticipated impacts of an adverse decision um, while continuing to generally try to protect and expand access to abortion across the board. So one of the most urgent questions that this a AHM case raises is whether providers will be able to continue to prescribe the mifepristone that they already have on their shelves if and when uh, its legal status changes when a decision um, goes into effect and it becomes potentially unapproved or mislabeled under federal law. Um, for patients and providers, you know, the thinking is that being able to continue using the mifepristone that's already in circulation could help maintain some degree of continuity as the landscape shifts very rapidly. Um, and as you may have seen, some states are even starting to stockpile mifepristone to ensure that they have a significant intrastate supply at the time that a decision takes effect. Um, so generally speaking, with regards to this question, the ACLU assessment um, is that the risks associated with prescribing mifepristone that's already on the shelves at the time a decision goes into effect to patients who are located within the state is relatively low under federal law, as long as there's compliance with the applicable REMS that you heard about from, from Kirsten earlier. Um, so because this federal law risk assessment is low, we at the New York Civil Liberties Union and our partners, including um, the New York Attorney General's Office, uh, we've been focusing on identifying and mitigating risks that providers could potentially face under New York state law for continuing to provide stock mifepristone after the decision takes effect. Um, so we have developed a legislative proposal to address certain ambiguities that we identified in New York law um, and to further insulate providers against potential legal exposure that these ambiguities um, could, could 
potentially engender. Um, and I, I'm being intentionally quite vague here as I, I don't want to highlight, you know, these weak points um, that, you know, those who are hostile to abortion could try to exploit until we, of course, are, you know, imminently ready to pass this legislation. Um, and so just in terms of timing, given the Supreme Court stay that will be in effect throughout the duration of the litigation, we are, you know, targeting the next legislative session as probably the time frame to pass these, um, these legislative fixes, you know, at a point before we expect a final decision to go into effect. So in addition to that work that, you know, is sort of future thinking, New York has already taken several other steps to protect access to medication abortion in New York. Earlier this spring, Governor Hochul announced that New York will stockpile a five-year supply of mesoprostol, so the other medication abortion drug, um, to ensure that the state has reliable access to that drug, you know, if mifepristone becomes fully unavailable um, and providers can continue to uh, excuse me, provide medication abortion using that mesoprostol only um, regimen. The, um, the state budget also included legislative language geared toward medication abortion access. Um, so it clarified that laws requiring private insurers to cover abortion care and laws prohibiting medical malpractice insurers from taking adverse action against providers because they provide abortion care, um, that both of those laws extend to medication abortion even if that medication is not FDA approved for abortion care, um, so long as it's recognized as a medication for abortion by another entity like the World Health Organization or the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And so this is intended to make sure that insurance will cover both mifepristone and mesoprostol only medication abortion regimens in the event that mifepristone becomes unapproved. Lastly, earlier this session, New York passed a law ensuring access to medication abortion on SUNY and CUNY campuses. So these state schools will, moving forward, be required to either provide medication abortion at campus healthcare facilities or to make arrangements for students to access care through local community providers. Um, so these are all measures that are targeted explicitly um, towards ensuring that medication abortion remains accessible in New York, um, but the state has also been somewhat of a leader in responding to the attacks on abortion more broadly since Dobbs. So last June, New York was one of the first states to enact a passage, um, excuse me, a package of laws aimed at reducing risk for abortion providers, patients, seekers, and helpers. Um, so when I say helpers, I mean both individuals. So an Uber driver bringing someone to their appointment, a babysitter watching someone's children while they uh, seek abortion care, as well as institutional helpers um, like abortion funds and logistical funds. Um, so New York enacted a package of laws um, intended to reduce the risk um, for you know, those, those individuals and entities who are involved in abortion care for patients traveling to New York from states where abortion is restricted or banned. So to the extent that other states try to investigate or punish someone because they provided, received, or helped facilitate abortion care here in New York, our state's protection laws make sure that New York courts and law enforcement will not participate in or contribute to that investigation or punishment. So for instance, New York won't domesticate out-of-state subpoenas connected to a proceeding related to lawful abortion care provided here in New York. Um, New York won't extradite or arrest someone on charges related to their involvement in New York abortion care. Um, and these laws also protect providers from facing both professional discipline as well as adverse action by their medical malpractice insurer because, of the, because they provide abortion care um, to patients who are from states where that care is prohibited. Um, and I just want to very quickly also highlight a bill that is very likely to pass in the next couple of days, which would build on these protections and extend them to cover medication abortion via telehealth, regardless of the patient's location. So that would ensure that New York is not complicit in efforts to punish that care, you know, even for patients who are unable to physically travel here to New York. Um, it's important to caution that, of course, these protection laws 
Uh, they do not, and you know, New York State cannot actually stop other states from initiating investigations and prosecutions, um, nor can they make something legal in another state that that state's laws prohibit. So what the laws really do is they make sure that New York does not participate in hostile states' efforts to punish care, um, and hopefully they throw some sand in the gears to make those investigations and prosecutions more difficult. Um, so there's, of course, you know, so much more that New York should be doing and is doing to protect and expand access to care. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll need to remain ready to continue to act and recalibrate as we see both how this uh, AHM case is ultimately decided um, and also how, you know, other states continue to legislate in the area of abortion. Um, so if, if folks want to know more about, you know, this work, I can drop some links, I think, in the chat or send them out after this. Um, to, you know, to learn more about what the NYCLU is doing um, and hope ways to get involved. And I'll pass it back to you, Josie. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, so I'm going to open it up quickly. We have the last five minutes for some questions. Um, we did get one question uh, submitted to um, the chat. Um, uh, M. Cohen, he asked, how worried are you that decisions like Dobbs and Alliance are undermining scientific and empirical evidence? It seems that science is not uh, deserving of constitutional deference when it is up against religious conscientious claims. This is Kirsten. I can just speak to the fact that I recently attended the food drug law enforcement uh, conference and it's FDA bar and lawyers at FDA meeting with pharma lawyers. And um, this case, AHM, was, you know, the prime, it was a major topic of discussion and people in that room were definitely concerned about the um, ability of courts to go after FDA's scientific review. Of course, courts already go out, I mean, there are challenges to FDA's authority, um, but those are usually on the basis of, you know, um, has a patent expired, does, you know, kind of legal questions, not medical and scientific questions. And I can only say like, I, and I know this from some public opinion research we've done, um, and others alluded to this, people like the FDA, they're skeptical of big government, but they're really skeptical of big pharma. <laughs> and they want a regulator standing between them and big pharma. And, you know, I, can't, I think of it like I get on a plane, I don't want to have to think about who's been responsible for evaluating the safety of that plane. I just want to know the plane's safe. Um, I can say as a, you know, product liability litigator who does um, work in the medical device and pharmaceutical space, this case is extremely scary for us. Um, one of our, you know, primary defenses is that the, that drugs are uh, gone through clinical studies, they are FDA approved. Um, you know, that's, you know, sort of the basis of, of a lot of, a lot of arguments uh, that we have. Um, Linda, I wanted to ask you just um, because uh, you sort of gave us a little rundown of what happened during the oral arguments in front of the Fifth Circuit. Um, have, have they asked that question and addressed sort of the ensuing chaos that would occur if um, you know, a decision would come out that um, revoked the FDA approval of drugs? Not really. I mean, in, in fact, uh, they had, in, in a sense, the opposite concern. I mean, this right. is, <laughs> um, it's a, preliminary injunction. It's not on a complete um, administrative record. Um, and they uh, they seemed like ready to jump to the merits. I mean, their insistence was like, well, why can't the FDA just get us the... Yeah, I think um, Judge Judge Ho uh, on that panel was pretty explicit in saying several times um, um, that the process of um, preparing an alternate label um, for um, mifepristone um, if uh, it were to roll back to the uh, pre-2016 uh, label. So it was really a, a very, you know, energetic court, I think, in terms of its, you know, view of its own authority over the FDA uh, rather, than, rather than vice versa. And sort of what was your, you know, sort of inclination on, on how this panel would rule? Do you think that they, they're they going to issue a decision um, that sort of upholds Judge Kaczmarek's uh, decision? Well, 
you know, it's it's all speculation, right? Um, based on an oral argument, but you know, they they certainly gave no indication that they were going to reverse Judge Kaczmarek. So I think the question is, you know, how much of the injunction is going to um, stand after their after their ruling, um, and presumably go up to the Supreme Court, you know, case at at that point. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out in, in, in response to the question in the chat about, you know, religious objections um, is, is that uh, the point was made very ably by counsel at, at oral argument that, that nobody is compelling any physician to prescribe mifepristone if they don't want to prescribe mifepristone. Uh, so in this case, it is really a false conflict between religious objections and FDA authority. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Linda. Um, I just wanted to, it is five o'clock now. So um, I uh, am, am, you know, hopeful that uh, maybe we will uh, meet again, um, you know, for, for better or for worse, um, to sort of discuss the, to discuss these upcoming decisions. Um, I have a feeling that this, this will uh, presum presumably go uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, as Linda said. I just want to thank you all um, on behalf of the women in law section, um, all of the attendees for coming and uh, thank you again uh, to my panels, my panelists for volunteering your time and your expertise and your knowledge on this issue. Um, and all to all my attendees, please look out for further programming from the women in law section. Thank you everybody, have a wonderful day. And thank you all, I just wanted to reiterate Justine's uh, sentiments there. Thank you to today's fantastic panel for that very informative, well done presentation. Uh, this does conclude our webinar, so please be sure to return to your My Learning dashboard and complete the course evaluation. Thank you for choosing New York State Bar Association programs and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you all so much for that program. <laughs>